So I may be finished with all of my retrospective videos now that I have talked about every single humongous entertainment game ever made, but rather than end things off with a somewhat generic and lukewarm conclusion video, I figured why not have a little more fun with it. Ranking videos are a thing I've been in the mood to make more of lately, so I figured, yeah, let's go for it. In this video, I am going to rank every single junior adventure game that was produced by Humongous back in the 1990s and early 2000s from worst to best. After all, a lot of these games varied from absolute gold to utter garbage, so I figured this subject matter would make for a great return to the ranking video format after not having made many in a long, long time. I really can't help myself from continuing to praise each of these games from Freddy Fish to Spy Fox, and I figured this would be a fun little celebration now that the retrospectives are complete. As always, I highly recommend you check out all of those previous Humongous Entertainment videos for a more in-depth look at each of the games I'm going to be discussing here in this video, as well as the entire history of the company as a whole, as that video is still one of my proudest creations to this day. I do want to preface this ranking really quick by mentioning that I have no intent of ranking the junior arcade games in this video because they aren't necessarily the easiest titles to compare to each other and adventure games, and they're all just basic arcade titles at the end of the day. They're just spin-offs and not remember nearly as fondly as the actual adventure titles are. Likewise, the Backyard Sports series will not be included in this video either because the sports games are in no way, shape, or form comparable to the adventure games, plus that franchise is too much of a beast to rank every game and quite frankly, I'm all burnt out on them after having made my gargantuan video on that series, so I have no desire to rank them, nor do I ever want to. The retrospective is enough to cover that if you ask me. Lastly, I will not be including the Junior Field Trip games, Big Thinkers, or Blue's Clues titles either because those aren't really comparable to the mainline humongous adventure games, and Moonbase Commander is obviously also out of the mix. This ranking is strictly about the 20 computer games that Humongous Entertainment specifically released under the moniker of Junior Adventure. I really don't think that ranking all of the other games too would be fair or as entertaining because like I said, they aren't really all that comparable. With that said, I'm really excited to get started on this, so why wait any longer? Let's go ahead and dive into ranking every single Junior Adventure game released by Humongous Entertainment. Number 20. The five-year decay of Humongous Entertainment began in June of 2001 when its bully of a parent company, Infogroms, decided to lay off nearly half of the staff because they're stupid, dumb, dumb idiots. Alas, the death of Humongous was set in motion with that decision right there as the company would continue to be neglected over the next handful of years despite their attempts to continue putting out products that were ultimately just a mixed bag of quality. Within that time frame came two junior adventure games, the first of which takes the bottom spot on this list. Putt-Putt Pep's Birthday Surprise is an absolute disgrace to the humongous entertainment name, and before I go any further, I just want to reiterate from my retrospective video that I blame 100% of this game's problems on Infogroms themselves. The staff that worked on this game did the best with what they were given, which wasn't anything at all, and that led to a lot of cut corners with this game. Where do I even start with this one? The animation is of a lower quality than any other Putt-Putt game, the general structure meanders left and right and has no real sense of guidance or progression, and the voice acting is downright awful. The entire game, Putt-Putt just comes across as this sarcastic, uncaring purple car that feels like the complete antithesis to Jason Ellefson's original role as the character. Prior Putt-Putt games saw him as this excited, energetic character who always wanted to go on an adventure, and here it just sounds like he's being a jerk with how sarcastic his responses are to everybody. Hey Pep, Mr. Kibble has some exciting new flavors of puppy food, and he'd like you to come try them. One of them's new and improved. And the worst part is that I'm almost certain it's unintentional. The voice direction in this game is just so sloppy that I can't connect with Putt-Putt the way I could in past titles. Even despite the fact that Nancy Cartwright's voice for the character sounded nothing like Jason's, I could still get some level of enthusiasm out of it. But that's not the only weak area here. The game reuses assets out the wazoo, backgrounds from past titles, character models, and animations. This game literally tries to pass off this car guarding the ball of yarn as a completely different character from the security guard featured in Joins the Circus. Smoke Smokey's animations, and most of this game's rooms are all just ripped straight from Enters the Race with minimal changes, and this game couldn't even get the putt-putt color changing mechanic to work, a feature that was available in every mainline game up to that point. Even the original MS-DOS putt-putt games could support a color change feature, I mean what happened here? 
It certainly doesn't help that the game's story is a knockoff of Fatty Bear's birthday surprise in both name and structure, with Putt-Putt planning a surprise party for his dog Pep by not so subtly going around Car Town and preparing for the big event. This entire concept actually creates one of the most annoying attributes of Pep's birthday surprise in that it leads to so many moments of just waiting. <laughs> sure, Pep. Go play with your friend, the Dalmatian. Hi, Smokey! Every time Putt-Putt wants to get something for this party, the player has to sit through an animation of Pep getting out and leaving to go someplace else. Then, when it's time to leave, they have to sit through another cutscene of Pep coming back. No other entry has such intrusive stops like this, and it's not like the game couldn't have been set up to just have Pep sleep at home while Putt-Putt went on errands the whole time or something. The game's soundtrack was also mostly ripped from Saves the Zoo and just had the animal noises removed. The whole game is a blatant rehash, but I think the real testament to the quality lies in the title because it is the only game in the series that doesn't follow the same naming scheme as every other entry. The first six Putt-Putt games are all named Putt-Putt Verbs the Noun, but Putt-Putt 7 just does away with that completely because I guess major identifiers such as the title of the game weren't important, and so they just ripped off Fatty Bear's game instead. Never in a million years would I recommend Pep's birthday surprise to anybody. It's an absolute disgrace to the Junior Adventure name, and I only wish it was never made in the first place. I'm not distraught over this title, but man, this is a bad game. Easily makes the bottom of the ranking, no question. Number 19. Coming in right behind Pep's birthday surprise is the other junior adventure game released under Atari in 2003, Pajama Sam 4 Life is Rough When You Lose Your Stuff. My sole reason for putting this game above the Putt-Putt title is for none other than the fact that at least this game doesn't reuse many assets. Sure, the environment may still be in an uninspired mix of Pajama Sam 1 and 3, but at least all of the rooms are original designs. But speaking of that, Life is Rough has no idea what it wants to be or what it's doing. The entire concept of the game feels like it's just trying to recapture the allure of the previous titles, but nearly every single thing it does was already done in a prior game. All of the other issues that were prevalent with Pep's Birthday Surprise are still here, however. I'm missing something I care about very much, too. My Pajama Man comic book. I saw a comic book. An old half-eaten cheese sandwich came by here just a little bit ago carrying a comic. Bad voice acting, without question, pretty poorly animated scenes, an uninspired plot about Sam needing to collect three articles of clothing in order to gain access to this mall so that he can get his comic book back, uninteresting puzzles, and unskippable screen transitions that really break up the flow. Whoa! Hey! Whoa! Whoa! Hey! There's a yo-yo! I could use a new yo-yo! I don't care about any of the characters here, there weren't any memorable moments, and you don't even get to see the actual bad guy of the game, Dr. Grime. He's just alluded to in the background, but he never actually shows up or does anything. It's a total letdown. Honestly, I can't even consider this a worthy member of the Pajama Sam series. Playing this game feels almost insulting at points, and I would never subject my kids, if I ever have any, to such a heinous act of slander. The game honestly just shows how little the team in Humongous was given to produce this, and it just makes me sad, because maybe if they actually had a company that, oh, I don't know, cared about them, then they could have been more capable of continuing to make fantastic adventure games for kids. Instead, we got this, and, well, it's just garbage. Truth be told, now that these games are out of the way, the ranking truly begins. Number 18. Alright, so I know there are a lot of people out there who always say it's unfair to blame a game for being bad when it's the first in its series, but let it be known that just because I rank it as the worst of the original adventure games does not mean I think it's terrible. Au contraire, I think Putt-Putt Joins the Parade is a great representation of what the very first adventure game made for kids would look like. Given that there was literally nothing that came before it, it is a major achievement in the field of computer software, and without it, none of the other games I'll be talking about in this video would even exist. 
But, by and large, all of the other games that came after it, aside from the ones in spots 19 and 20 of course, are all better than it because they took what was in the first game and improved or expanded upon it in all sorts of different ways. Logically speaking, the first game usually should be worse than its sequels. That said, that's not always true, but those innovations and milestones that were made off of it led to making the original game become more and more archaic as time went on. And by the early 2000s, the game just couldn't compare anymore. It's not the game's fault, but it's a sign that things got better. Joins the Parade tells the story of how Putt-Putt first met his dog Pep, got a paint job or car wash, and a balloon to participate in the Car Town Pet Parade. Those three things, of course, being the major objectives of the game. If a player knows what they're doing, and honestly, even if they don't, they can finish the entire game in under half an hour because it is extremely short, small, and confined. The puzzles are practically the easiest ones that Humongous has ever made, whether it be mowing someone's yard or trying to find the one vehicle that matches this image amongst a sea of smaller vehicles. The voice acting isn't great, and the graphics certainly haven't aged as nicely as most of the hand-drawn animated games have, but again, all of these flaws are not the game's fault. At the time, this was a major achievement, like I said, in educational software, and it deserves to be recognized as such. I truthfully, though, don't have many positive things to say about Joins the Parade outside of the fact that it was the first, because at the end of the day, the game by itself just isn't enjoyable to me. Yeah, it did a lot of great things as a stepping stone, but I'm not ranking these games based on their significance, I'm ranking them based on their content, and Joins the Parade is very limited in that department. It also feels like it skews a little too young compared to a lot of the other junior adventure games that were made later on. I appreciate the game more than I like it, that's my stance on it short and sweet. It's a start, a very rocky one at that, so that is why I place it at the bottom of the list. Number 17. Coming in at the 17th spot to the surprise of probably very few people, Fatty Bear's Birthday Surprise. Now, at first I wasn't even going to include this title in the ranking because it isn't one of Humongous' big four IPs, but it was technically released under the Junior Adventure name, so I feel obligated to give it some time, even if I don't think it's all that great. The premise of the game revolves around this stuffed teddy bear named Fatty Bear, who comes alive at night to prepare his owner's birthday party the next day. What starts as a harmless little excursion to create a birthday cake for his owner quickly becomes a nightmare once this puppy is set on the loose to run around all over the house. Unlike most of Humongous' adventure games which usually presents the player with a checklist or a guide of some sorts, Fatty Bear is actually less direct with what the objectives of the game are in order to win. I respect it for how open it is, much more so than Joins the Parade, but it's still rather limited in terms of what all there is to do. Fatty Bear is short. Not quite as short as Putt-Putt's first adventure, but there's not a lot of depth to this one when it comes to the puzzles and structure. Fatty Bear as a character also isn't as interesting if you ask me. He's got this weird whispery voice, but as far as a personality goes, it's just kind of bland. I find Putt-Putt's enthusiasm far more appealing in his game compared to this. I can at least compliment the soundtrack and graphics because it really does capture that come alive at night sort of feeling and atmosphere, but ultimately the game comes across as forgettable because it's the only one of its kind and gets vastly overshadowed by the later adventure titles. It only has one pathway, so replayability is practically non-existent too. You play it once, you play it once, and you're kinda done. The game's not one I'm particularly fond of, it's just a step up from Joins the Parade, really. Number 16. And next, we have the third and final MS-DOS game released by Humongous Entertainment. Gee, it's almost like the company was getting better and better with every new release or something. Crazy, right? Well don't get used to it. Yeah, relative to the other two DOS games, Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon is a pretty exciting step forward, even if it is still just as basic. At least the game decides to go for a bit more story with this one and adds a couple more objectives, considering there's an entire intro sequence with Putt-Putt going to Mr. Firebird's fireworks factory, where he ends up flying up to space and getting stuck on the moon. There's the introduction of the character Rover, and a whole subplot of him being left up there, and quite a few interesting characters to meet on the moon as well. It's remarkably apparent that the team in Humongous at this time was making more creative decisions with this go-around compared to the previous two titles with the sheer diversity of alien designs and locations featured in the game's setting. It does everything a sequel should, keep what worked, and improve on everything else. 
The puzzles to solve are a bit more thought out than before, and the game takes roughly one and a half times as long to complete. There's a more pressing goal this time around with needing to rebuild the rocket and get home and bring Rover with you as well, and there are a few bonus minigames that make for a nice side distraction here and there. I give the game a lot of credit for taking great strides in advancing the standards for child-aimed adventure games. It's just that, unfortunately, I can't place it much higher in my ranking because, again, what came after it just surpasses it in nearly every way possible. Despite making more complicated puzzles than the game that came before it, most of them are still a little too simplistic for their own good, with two of the solutions basically being given to the player without any effort required. The DOS games are archaic and haven't aged as well as the hand-drawn animation has. The audio is even lower quality than later titles, the soundtracks don't stand out to me aside from maybe one or two songs, and most of all they are games that I don't really get anything out of on a repeat playthrough. They're all very one and done, if I'm being honest. It's not the game's fault necessarily though, I mean they didn't even come up with the idea for multiple pathways yet. It's very much the result of there not being any games prior for them to really go off of, seeing as they are basically the first adventure game makers aimed at young kids. As well as the limited technological capabilities of course too. Computer software development in terms of games was still very much a young, young field at that time. After all, Humongous jumped on the hand-drawn scanning method early before that really took off through the second half of the 90s and early 2000s. They were kind of the pioneers of that, even if they didn't do it first. But still, I'm judging all of these games in comparison to every other, and while I would say Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon is a great adventure game for 1993 standards, it is far outclassed by all of the other adventure games that came after it. Undeniably, Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon is the best DOS game without question though, and the groundwork it laid for all future titles should not be taken for granted. Number 15. My sincerest apologies for the bottom half of this video being so loaded with Putt-Putt games, but alas, being the intellectual property targeted at the youngest demographic comes with the caveats of more simplistic game structure and less complicated puzzles. That's not to say these games are bad. They're not. It's just that they pale in comparison to the rest of the company's catalog. As I said, one of the biggest factors I am considering for this video is replayability, seeing as many humongous games pride themselves in having various combinations of puzzles and pathways. Hence why every game in the ranking so far has been a title that only had one. Unfortunately, this trend continues with Putt-Putt Joins the Circus, which I'm ranking above the rest of these games because it's ultimately decent. The DOS games weren't bad games, they were just too simplistic and archaic for the standards humongous set once they switched to the hand-drawn animation method of creating their games and haven't aged nearly as well as the remaining 15 titles have. Putt-Putt Joins the Circus is the game that I would call the epitome of doing the bare minimum, however. It's got all of the fundamentals in place, but it doesn't particularly shine in any one area. The animation looks great, the puzzles have several steps, there's a nice cameo appearance by Baby Jumbo from Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo, but something just feels missing with this one. It doesn't come across as a game with a creative vision the way other Putt-Putt titles I'll be talking about later on in the video do. This one kind of feels like it was just made to meet a deadline. My biggest point of contention with this Putt-Putt title especially is that it reuses the blueprints from Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo with minimal changes made. Both games have a near identical premise of rescuing the performers slash zoo animals before the attraction opens. I mean, this game was literally called Putt-Putt Saves the Circus at one point. None of the puzzles nor characters in Joins the Circus are particularly memorable to me, and the audio quality of the game has the worst compression I think I've noticed out of any junior adventure title. Whoa! This must be where Mr. Sweeney keeps all the tools to fix things for his big top circus. Again, ultimately I think the game is fine, but it's just fine. If there weren't any other junior adventure games to compare it to, I'd probably have more appreciation for it, but Circus really fails to break new ground, and if anything, it's just a major regression for the Putt-Putt franchise as it has now reverted back to only hosting one playthrough of the entire game, rather than incorporating multiple pathways in the way that other games do. I realize it's debatable that I rank it above Moon because Moon did more to progress the franchise forward, but my decision for this is that ultimately, Circus is the better game, even if it was less in Innovative. Maybe that's an unfair advantage, but hey, that's just how I'm ranking it. Number 14. Coming in at number 14 is the first Freddy Fish title on this list with Freddy Fish 2. I really don't like Freddy Fish 2 all that much. I was a lot more positive towards it in my retrospective on the franchise, but when it comes down to my personal opinion, there's not a lot here I love outside of it having the best skit section in the entire series. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> Never gets old. Sadly, the overwhelming majority of Freddy Fish 2 just feels like some sort of response to parents who wrote in to them saying the first game was too mature or too scary for their kids at the time, and while I don't actually know if that is true or not, the game has a lot of hints scattered about it that just makes me sort of infer that that happened. Maybe it didn't though, I, I truly don't know. Maybe it was a creative decision to go this way. Like I said, I'm just theorizing here. The first game took place in this deep, dark undersea area with trenches, junkyards, deceased whales, volcanoes. The soundtrack reflects this atmosphere with its somber pieces. The main threat of the game is a food shortage that could cause the entire ecosystem to die of starvation. The villains were these two intimidating sharks. The game was bold, it had guts, it took risks. Freddy Fish 2 basically tones down all of that. Now, instead of a life-threatening crisis, Freddy and Luther are trying to get their friends toys back. Now, instead of exploring dark caves and a king's castle, they're going to school. It's just such a lackluster follow-up to the stakes of the first title, and I'm not saying that I expect humongous games to have such high stakes considering the audience, but when you go from a grand adventure to school? It's just lame. Not to mention this point is further made self-evident by the way that many of the previous villain characters got toned down. Eddie the Eel, for instance, went from the scariest creature in the entire game to this. I'm hungry and I'm grumpy and a bad mood to boot. Swim too close and you may go down my chute. Meanwhile, both the sharks and the squid father were made more stupid and kind of lovable. Boss doesn't berate Spongehead nearly as much, nor does his voice direction reflect the same threat of the first game, and the squid father is an idiot because he could just go to the store and buy a toy for like $5. Like, why has he got to go through the effort of making these sharks steal a bunch from kids? A lot of the environment design also feels like the light equivalent of Freddy Fish 1. Sure, there's still dark areas, but it's not as dark, and the added songs just take away any potential tension that could be arising out of the situation. Don't get me wrong, I understand the game was made for young ages, but even as a kid when I was playing this game, I still thought it was lame. Even if the first one scared me a lot, I thought it was way cooler than the second one because of that. The game does make an interesting choice in the way it designed its puzzle structure though by having eight individual items, of which five could be chosen at random for any given playthrough, leading to the 56 potential pathways of puzzle combinations in the game. It sounds ambitious on paper, until you realize that three of the puzzles are solved by going the exact same directions on the map in the exact same sequence. I still respect the game for trying something like this, but I think the execution could be a bit better, especially on that front. Even still, despite the many disappointments that come along with Freddy Fish 2, I prefer it over Putt Putt Joins the Circus because at least there is some level of innovation and replayability present here. Neither game really knows what they want to be because they take a lot of inspiration from the previous titles without doing much that's substantially new, and that gives them a bit of an identity problem. But hey, at least Freddy Fish 2 has Chumlet. <laughs> Classic. Number 13. Okay, so admittedly, I didn't do the best job making my true feelings known about Spy Fox Operation Ozone during my section on it in the original Spy Fox retrospective video that I did, so this is my opportunity to clarify where I stand. I like Operation Ozone as a game. I really do. It still has a lot of the same Spy Fox wit, fun puzzles to solve, a whole slew of gadgets to utilize, and the best secret ending area of the entire trilogy. However, most of its ideas are simply repeats of the previous two games, and even though I would probably say I enjoy Spy Fox 3 more than 2, taking a more objective stance leads me to knock it down quite a number of spots because most of the game is copying off of what 1 and 2 already did. Obviously, the game does a few things new, such as the introduction of having the game take place across multiple locations instead of just one major area. There's a jungle, a lake, and a desert to explore, each with their own puzzles to solve and unique characters to meet. Hi! You there! With the prickly pear! Prickly pear? What prickly pear? The x-ray machine shows that you have a prickly pear. Now all prickly pears stay in the prickly pear ranch. Those are the rules. Yep, they're certainly unique. 
although I wish that the Chickle and APD number were also gotten different ways too. This was the perfect opportunity to go the Pajama Sam route and have all four items have two pathways each, but unfortunately only half of the collectibles do this. And while I do enjoy getting to visit each of these locations, I personally prefer having a more contained experience when it comes to the Spy Fox series. Ozone doesn't feel disjointed necessarily, and I think it sort of replicates how James Bond movies tend to take place over multiple different locations around the globe, depending on the circumstances of course, so this is most definitely done as a mirror of that, but I don't know. Having one giant expansive area with all sorts of nooks and crannies to explore is far more appealing to me than having a few small areas branching off from a main hub. And don't get me wrong, there's another game that ranks higher on this list that has an identical structure to this one with it taking place across multiple locations, but the premise of that game makes far more sense for it to be structured in that manner. Plus, each of those areas feels bigger. Here, Plato Pushpin just gives Spy Fox a list and says, go find these arbitrary items at these locations so you can win the game, but it doesn't quite tie together. Poodles Galore is also a fine villain, but her motivation and plan overlaps far too much with William the Kids. The economic business person supervillain had already been done twice by both Dry Cereal and Hold the Mustard that this just feels redundant. There are numerous other villain archetypes that could have been chosen for her character instead of doing the exact thing a third time. The writing can also get a little obnoxious with the same repeated jokes getting said multiple times over the course of the game. It's still enjoyable, but it feels like a major step down compared to the first two entries, and I don't think the writing quite holds a candle to dry cereal. Like I said, I think Operation Ozone is a fun game, but it's not without its problems. And I really wish the franchise could have continued onward beyond this game because it's not the best note for the series to fizzle out on. I see loads of potential in more Spy Fox sequels should they ever see the light of day by some miracle, but as it stands, this is still a fine enough game. Things are only going to continue to get better from here. Number 12. Next up, I'm ranking Putt Putt Saves the Zoo in the number 12 spot on my list, which may come as a bit of a shock to those that know about this game, given that I tended to give the ones that don't have multiple pathways a more difficult time. Well, Putt Putt Saves the Zoo is the exception to the rule here, because despite the game presenting the player with the same exact experience every single time, this is such a well put together game. I rank Putt Putt Saves the Zoo above the previous few spots with multiple pathways because it has a clear vision and was a massive step forward for Humongous Entertainment as a whole in 1995. Freddy Fish 1 may have proven it was possible to create a computer game using the digital ink and painting method for hand-drawn scans, but Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo solidified the sheer level of quality that these games could achieve. This game is gorgeous, from the colorful characters to the background to the smoothness of Putt-Putt's movement. It all feels so vivid and seamless, and very much ahead of its time considering that most animated television shows were still being made on hand-drawn cells back then. The structure of the game is pretty straightforward. The Cartown Zoo is about to open, but six of the baby animals are missing and Putt-Putt needs to help Outback Owl rescue them all from danger before the attraction is open to the public. Within the zoo, there's all sorts of features to be found, from mini games to picture taking to a trip down the river rapids. There's loads to see and explore within this neat little title that easily makes it the number one recommendation I would give any parent looking to introduce the concept of an adventure game to their children. Seriously, this is so incredibly well made as someone's first computer game, and someday, if I ever have kids, this will be the very first game I ever introduce to them because it succeeds on so many levels. It's easy enough that any kid can latch onto it, the characters all have distinct personalities that they're sure to love, and the number one thing I praise the game the most for is that, while it may only contain one set path, the sheer number of situations that the game took into account is admirable. I mean, there's different dialogue that can occur depending on whether or not Putt-Putt speaks to the baby animal or the parent first, and additional dialogue for which one they talk to second based on that first choice. Putt-Putt also has the ability to go back to where the baby animals live once they're rescued and talk to them that way. There's several options for conversations with Outback Owl. The photo feature provides a lot of exploration for any kid that wants to try and take a picture of every animal in the game. The works. Now, I realize I just hit you with a massive wave of positivity despite only being at the number 12 spot, but that's why I'm going to shift the frame of reference back to looking at the company's catalog as a whole. Yes, it is a one and done game. Yes, the puzzles are far simpler and take less steps than the other adventure games do. And yes, the story isn't deep in the slightest. If I were to make a top whatever number list of humongous entertainment games, this entry would be where I start, because I truly feel that every game from here on out, including Saves the Zoo, are humongous 
is best. Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo has drive, heart, identity, and creative vision on its side, and it really shows with how much it improved upon the mistakes from Freddy Fish 1. Speaking of Freddy, Number 11. Now on my personal list of all-time favorite humongous games, this is the number one Freddy Fish game for me. Not only was it my first experience with humongous entertainment games in general, it was the first video game I've ever played in my life, so you better believe this one is very special to me. Dare I say, I may not have more nostalgia for any other video game period than I do for my very first ever, and that's why Freddy Fish 1 will always be a bright spot in my life. Without it, I never would have gotten into anything else. Now that said, I also want to be fair here and judge it as a game and not just a precious childhood memory. It's very rough around the edges, but at the same time, I don't think a single other humongous game took as many risks as this one did. The suspenseful premise, the darker visuals and environments, the scarier atmosphere, the complete change in art style from all the games that came prior, this is unquestionably the darkest adventure game in terms of story with the fate of the entire ocean's population at stake now that Grandma Grouper's kelp seed treasure has been stolen. It's bold. Really, really bold. I cannot celebrate this game's victories enough. Going back to experience this game as an adult gives me so much more appreciation for it knowing that this game was essentially rushed. True story, literally halfway through the game being finished, Ron Gilbert got his team together and asked how willing they were to scrap everything in order to try making the game all over again via a new style of animation that had hardly ever been done before. Of course, despite none of them really being animators, they were up to the task, and with half the time that they had before when they started the project, they still managed to pull it off. Many sleepless nights and weekends were spent touching up the game in every possible way, and boy, I cannot thank those individuals enough for putting that time in because this game was such a big part of my life. I genuinely wish I could thank those employees, and if by some rare, oddball chance that one or two happen to be watching this, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Seriously. Other pros of the game include multiple pathways, which can cross over in various ways thanks to each of the three bottles, which are the main collectibles of the game that point you towards your next objective, having multiple different spawn points. The cast of characters that can be found here range from the friendly types such as King Crab to the menacing creatures like the Anglerfish or Junkyard Dogfish. Ooh. The animation definitely hasn't aged as well as other humongous games because Freddy and Luther tend to go off model quite a lot more often than I initially remembered, and the voice acting isn't up to snuff just yet, which is something I actually should have given Freddy Fish 2 credit for now that I think about it and go off script. The voice acting does improve in that game. It's still good here, but it doesn't seem like most of the actors quite got into their characters just yet. And the soundtrack. Oh man, this is George the Fat Man Sanger's finest work ever, if you ask me. Easily in the top three greatest humongous soundtracks without question. The way the songs capture the feeling of underwater sea creatures navigating this dark, almost nighttime seafloor is just magnificent. I love the maracas, the steel drums, the synths, all of it just comes together so perfectly. Admittedly, the puzzles are still on the easier side, seeing as Freddy is only meant to be a little more difficult than Putt-Putt, but everything else in the game makes up for that. This was the first game to introduce replayability in general, so I definitely respect it for that innovation, but alas the game is still a bit linear seeing as you can only go after one bottle at a time, making it a bit restrictive in that sense. Regardless, from my perspective, it is an incredible experience that I recommend any kid give a shot at some point, although maybe wait till they're at least in elementary school, otherwise some of the sea creatures might elicit everlasting underwater phobias the way it did me. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. But aside from that, you can't go wrong with Freddy Fish 1. It's a bona fide classic, for sure. Number 10. Cracking the bottom spot of the top 10 comes Pajama Sam 3 You Are What You Eat From Your Head to Your Feet. Now, I'll be honest, as a kid, I would have ranked this in the top 5 best, and I'd even place it above Pajama Sam 2. Viewing this game from an adult's perspective, however, Pajama Sam 3 has more shortcomings than the younger me ever truly realized. Its similarities to 2 are very apparent, and I guess I can't fault the game too much because 2 is a phenomenal title, but there are just some choices made here that don't have the everlasting effect on me that 1 and 2 do. For starters, the characters. Now, on one hand, all of the characters are very in theme, seeing as this is a game about the different food groups and all. On the other hand, other than Chuck Cheddar, none of them are particularly memorable to me the way the characters in other games are for one specific reason. Archetypes. I honestly couldn't tell you what Bean47's personality is supposed to be. 
tiny, I guess? Pierre is just French and Granny Smith is old. Characters in prior games are more than just their archetype. Not to get ahead of myself, but Velo is a super docile and shy machine part, while King is an adrenaline junkie thrill seeker, know what I mean? Their personalities weren't solely based on what they were, there was more to them than that. Here, Granny Smith's entire personality is that she's old because she's a Granny Smith apple. In Pajama Sam 1, Otto was this overly cautious, doubtful wooden boat that was afraid he would sink. These doubts then carried on to other aspects such as the waterfalls he travels down or the magnet. Granny Smith is nowhere near as complex and part of that stems from the fact that you don't spend much time with her, or any of the delegates for that matter, or any of the characters in general. The puzzles I find also aren't as fun to solve as prior games. I distinctly remember finding the answers to the fortune cookies questions to be my least favorite quest in like almost any humongous game. Bean 47s are either a monotonous counting game that requires no intelligence or a puzzle that can be solved in literal seconds. Pierre's is the exact same puzzle in both playthroughs except the location of the bell is swapped one room over. I also don't enjoy how segmented the game is because while I think the concept of using the heart to serve as a central chamber that leads to four sections of Mop Top Island, everything else feels so separated now compared to the previous games where the locations would overlap and intersect. I don't mind this in a Freddy Fish game, but that was always such a huge appeal of the Pajama Sam locations. Gurney Smith is always located in the stomach, Chuck is always located in the mountains. I think the concept of the island is genius with it being modeled after Sam's own body, but it comes at the detriment of the puzzles. Only a handful of the challenges in the game require you to visit more than one area in the world to solve them. On the flip side, the soundtrack is phenomenally catchy and the backgrounds are gorgeous as always. Sure, it takes place partially in a forest like Pajama Sam 1, but the island of Mop Top is almost nothing like the Land of Darkness. The plumbers are also pure genius, and I'll never know how they got away with this in a children's game. Seriously. I debated on whether or not this belongs above Freddy Fish 1, but it is a lot less restrictive in its gameplay that ultimately makes it the better game. It's not linear, and it's got multiple pathways. Plus, the animation far outclasses it. Don't get me wrong, Pajama Sam 3 is a fun-filled adventure game from start to finish, but as I've already said, this is a comparison to other adventure games made by the same company, and as such, it only takes the number 10 spot because there are definitely better games than it. Still an enjoyable experience though, it may have its problems, but Pajama Sam 3 will always hold a special place in my heart. Number 9 Next up, I'm awarding the number 9 spot to none other than Freddy Fish 4. Those of you who have seen my retrospective segment on this game will probably recall that I said this is the game in the franchise that's just sort of there for me, and that hasn't changed. However, setting my own personal viewpoint aside for this title, I can't deny that the case of the Hogfish Wrestlers of Briny Gulch gets a lot of things right. The game has a coherent, albeit strange, theme going on with the western setting, but the characters, environments, music, and story all reflect the aesthetic very well. The puzzles have a good amount of thought put into them that requires the player to fully explore the entire world of Briny Gulch in order to solve every puzzle, and sure, the game can technically be completed in two separate playthroughs, four if you want to see all the endings, but it takes the pajama Sam route of having two different variations of puzzle chains for all three items. Except the bow tie slash bandana, those are two completely different items that serve the same purpose. This of course provides for six different possible playthroughs, and if you consider the four separate endings as well, there are actually 24 different combinations of events present in the game, so that's still pretty substantial, maybe not as much as Freddy Fish 2 and 3, but it's around the standard that most humongous games tend to be. I also find that the two villain lackeys are decently entertaining, and I like how the game gets away with certain things, such as the hogfish slinging chocolate cake at the grunts instead of, well, you know. Will you eat cake? Here, try it! But, it's chocolate! Yeah. The things I primarily praised this game for before was the way it locked certain rooms behind obstacles that the player had to figure out a way around in order to access a new area, whether it was the sunken ship that requires the water level to be raised before it can be accessed, or the cave that's being guarded by that pink shark who won't let them pass. It gives a great sensation of reward and accomplishment when a player is roadblocked and finds a way to overcome it. Not that other Freddy Fish games didn't do this prior, but it's at its best in Freddy Fish 4. I also admire the way the game sets up a few characters to be the the potential Mr. Big in the game, because it asks a lot of the players to use their memories when they see the item on the crate in the cell, and put two and two together using context clues. 
Truth be told, the only reason I like Freddy Fish 4 less than 1, 3, and 5 is just because of personal preference. I'm not the biggest western fan in the world, and I got this game last out of the entire Freddy Fish franchise, so I don't have nearly as much playtime on this one that I do with other games. Still, I can set my personal disinterest aside to admit that ultimately, 4 is a well put together game and deserves to be recognized as such. I realize I can't make a personal ranking 100% objective, but I am trying to be as fair as possible here, and I think my placement of Freddy Fish 4 is a good example of that. Number 8. Putt Putt Enters the Race It's a good game. Personally speaking, it's not nearly as memorable to me as the two titles that came before it chronologically, but truth be told, it is a perfect example of calling back to the early days while also doing something entirely new. Unlike the past few Putt-Putt titles, which were sending him to different locations, Enters the Race returns to form and puts the setting of the game back in Car Town, where Putt-Putt is gearing up for the big race that's coming up soon. As such, he needs to traverse the local area and find the various assets that he will need in order to participate. The first hub of Car Town maintains the exact same layout as Putt-Putt joins the parade, and it's awesome that Humongous decided to maintain that continuity. Of course, there are also references to past games with the inclusions of Smokey, Rover, and Outback Al, each of whom Putt-Putt has assisted in the past once before, so any fan of the previous Putt-Putt titles is sure to enjoy seeing them again. No Mr. Firebird though, sadly. But yeah, the game is only one of two Putt-Putt games that actually features more than one potential pathway, which already gives it a huge sense of replayability for that part alone. However, Enters the Race is not without its faults, and I would be remiss if I did not mention my least favorite aspect of the whole game, the recycling mechanic. Never in a million years did I expect to have to grind in a humongous entertainment game, but lo and behold, Enters the Race was here to surprise me, because having to collect up to 12 bottles and or take two trips to the farm just to acquire some coins to purchase the tires is so such a tedious waste of time. I appreciate the message about recycling and all, but it's just padding for the sake of padding functionally speaking. The game did not need to make this a mandatory thing because rescuing the tow truck should have been enough for him to just give you the tires as a reward. Add that on top of the fact that the car wash and paint station both return from the first game and also require coins, which means you need to earn even more currency if you want to change Putt-Putt's color, and yeah. This would be a lot better if the tires were obtained through another method and the coins were only needed to change Putt-Putt's color. Aside from that though, the puzzles are decent although a bit on the easy side because again, this is a Putt-Putt game after all. But the final payoff is definitely worth it because actually getting to race around as Putt-Putt against the computer? Well, that's a dream come true. This is the only time in the entire series that you can control Putt-Putt like an actual car, and even though the acceleration is automatic, it's still awesome regardless that we get to experience something like this. Definitely a fun final note to end the game on, for sure. I may not be the biggest fan of Enters the Race, seeing as I have no nostalgic attachment to it because it was one of the few Putt-Putt games I never experienced as a kid, but I can't deny that it's a pretty good game. If it weren't for the grinding aspect holding it back, this one might rank a little bit higher on the list. Number 7. Freddy Fish 5 though, man I think this game is swell. Freddy Fish, in the case of the creature of Coral Cove's greatest strength, comes in the form of its overall structure because it is completely unlike any other Freddy Fish game that came prior. No more linear progression, no more lists of items that need to be collected, nothing. The game just sets the player loose and it's up to them to kind of figure things out as the game goes along. I can understand why some would probably be against a Freddy Fish game being more open, but when I played this game as a kid, while I did find some of the puzzles a little challenging, nothing ever completely stumped me to a point where I needed to ask my parents for help. Help. It takes the Spy Fox approach essentially. The player knows the end goal is to figure out why the monster is terrorizing the park, and so they need to go around collecting clues in order to get to the bottom of things. I really find this to be a fresh take on the Freddy Fish formula, as it was a bold decision for Humongous, but I think the game is all the better for it. Also, I can't go without acknowledging how cool the idea of having this really long and continuous hallway is. Sure, the game stutters a bit as it transitions from screen to screen, but I still admire the concept and thought it worked pretty well. It was a risk. The game has two major pathways and two minor pathways, just like Spy Fox Operation Ozone, which means the game has four potential combinations, and all the game's content can be seen in just two runs. But honestly, the puzzle chains are long enough that I feel it justifies itself. An unfortunate drawback to the more story-focused gameplay, however, is that the game results in the same final villain every single time. 
So the multiple endings of the previous two Freddy games have been taken away, but at the cost of that, we ended up getting one of the best final areas in the whole franchise, tied with Freddy Fish 1, so I can't complain too much. Marty's house may only be a few screens, but it's such a cool area and feels almost like a final boss's lair, essentially. It's a much needed improvement over Freddy Fish 4's area, I can definitely say that much. Freddy Fish 5 tends to be one of the most forgotten Freddy Fish games I've noticed, seeing as it was the last ever humongous game released before Infogrom destroyed the company in June of 2001. Also, as a side note, I said during my section on Moonbase Commander that Infogrames purchased Humongous in June of 2001. That was incorrect. Infogrames purchased the company in late 1999. I don't know why I confused the purchase date with the date of the layoffs, but I did, so just making an addendum to that, what I said in my company history video was the correct thing. Anyways, yeah. Freddy Fish 5 is pretty enjoyable. Definitely deserves some more recognition, if you ask me. Number 6. The second entry in the Spy Fox franchise is a game that I'm slowly but surely starting to come around to more. I never really cared for the game as much as a kid because the bleaker, washed out color choice was nowhere near as appealing to me, and I didn't like the villain story or soundtrack as much as other humongous games. However, looking at the game from a new perspective outside of my own personal childhood lens has led me to admit that, hey, Spy Fox 2 is still a solid adventure game from beginning to end. In fact, it has a great opener in which the player gets to go through this exciting chase sequence trying to avoid some smelly goons, then they get to infiltrate the gigantic dog bot overlooking the World's Fair where they meet Napoleon LaRoche face to face and learn of the diabolical scheme before being thrown into a holding cell. It's actually a great introductory sequence in the way it's structured because the sequence of events, albeit a bit linear, is exhilarating right from the get-go. I kinda like the gradual build method of storytelling when it comes to these adventure games, but throwing the player right into the action and then giving them some breathing room is certainly a way to stray from the norm. I respect it. I personally don't like LaRoche as a villain all that much, but I enjoy the irony of him using a giant mechanical dog to destroy the city and squish everyone else like bugs. Also, getting it out of the way now, his final area to get to the best ending is the least engaging of the three because it has the least interesting puzzle of the whole franchise. Very simple, not very engaging, I'm not really a fan. The game, unlike any other humongous entertainment title, strictly only has two playthroughs, either the Flytrap or the Restructo Lux paths. There's no combinations, no ways to mix and match or find some third hidden path, which I somehow thought was there when I was younger. I don't have a clue how I got that idea, but no. Only two paths. Both routes are pretty well thought out and have you doing completely different things when you go to a specific location. The only parts of the game that don't really feel that different from each other are the Walter Wireless sequence in Wii World, which is still a really cool mini game that I'm glad they threw in there and I don't mind you having to play it twice, and the part where you have to gain access to the dog bot via the breathalyzer. But even though these moments are repeated, they're still pretty enjoyable quests to accomplish, so it's not really a negative trait. Regardless of that, I still enjoy the setting of the World's Fair and some of the locations like the museum, Wii World, and the ice rink where Spy Fox can pull off some sick figure skating moves. I was so good I burned the skates out. All of the negatives that I can even say about this game are, for the most part, just my personal taste getting in the way. It's a solid adventure experience from beginning to end, even if the writing isn't quite to the same level of the first game. Number 5. Aw oh yeah, we finally made it to the top 5. Things really start to get good from here. That being said, kicking us off with the fifth slot comes the final Putt-Putt game that I've yet to talk about, Putt-Putt Travels Through Time, and I mean really, this game outshines all of the other Putt-Putt titles by a country mile. With the entire premise of the game taking place across four different time periods, this allows for us as the players to witness all sorts of different automobiles across history, ranging from the hovercrafts of the future to the locomotives of the Wild West, all the way back to the Stone Age's own innovation at the time, a wheel with a stick through it. Pure genius. Seriously, why don't more people appreciate this gag? It's hysterical. The number one reason I praise Putt-Putt Travels Through Time so much is because of its design. The game is broken into four areas, like I said, and Putt-Putt has four items that he needs to recover before school that day. 
ergo, one for each area. However, every item can spawn in every area, one per time period, meaning that there are technically 16 different puzzles that the player would need to solve in order to experience the full game. That also means that the game has a minimum of four unique playthroughs to them, the most of any humongous game. And while sure the puzzles tend to be on the easier side, this is the Putt-Putt series we're talking about here. Need I forget to mention that, aside from Pep, almost every single other item requires the player to travel to multiple time periods in order to acquire it, which really engages the player in passing through time and learning about how things were and are yet to be. There's also quite a handful of minigames present here too, such as the balloon game with Pep, the arcade cabinet, the volcano Simon Says game. Travels Through Time had a lot of work put into it, including Jason Ellison's role as Putt-Putt because I think this is easily his best performance as the character, hands down. Unfortunately, it's also his last, but I'm at least grateful we got him one more time in this game. Travels Through Time is a game that I'm continuing to learn new things about decades after I first played it. For instance, several viewers informed me that you can actually adjust not only the color of Putt-Putt's body in this game, but also select from one of three different shades of that color, a feature that does not exist in any other Putt-Putt game at all, which is really cool. I never knew this. Putt-Putt's games may end up taking up 50% of the bottom half of Junior Adventure Games in this ranking video, but that has nothing to do with Travels Through Time. This game succeeds at everything it sets out to do, and I have very few negative things to say about it. A lot of the characters that were created for this game are memorable, like Tobias and, ah yes, Merlin of course. Could not praise this one enough for all it does. Truly. Number 4. And taking the fourth spot comes Freddy Fish 3 and the case of the missing conch shell, irrefutably the best game in its series, if you ask me. Now, of course, I will always have a soft spot for Freddy Fish 1, but Freddy Fish 3, bar none, introduces the best structure, design, and culprits in the franchise. After the misstep that was Freddy Fish 2, Humongous decided to breathe new life into Freddy Fish by completely changing the setting and sending Freddy and Luther off on a vacation to more tropical waters, where Luther's uncle. Blenny is set to host the Founders Day Festival as the Grand Exalted Keeper of the Conch. Unfortunately, when they arrive, they discover Blenny's been imprisoned for allegedly stealing the conch shell, so it's up to Freddy and Luther to figure out who really stole it by discovering the three golden pipes that old Soggy can use to pick up the scent of the offender. Personally, I think this game finds the perfect balance in difficulty when it comes to the golden pipes because it has three different levels of challenge, one easy, one medium, and one hard, which is just the right amount for the middle tier. Here, Freddy Fish games. Freddy Fish 2 tends to be too easy all throughout, and Freddy Fish 5 is a little more on the challenging side, but Freddy Fish 3 kind of hits that sweet spot of having a little bit of both. There's quite an abundance of locations that the Golden Pipes can spawn in, and a whole slew of characters to meet that all play a different role and are a different species entirely. The game is bright, beautiful, and exquisitely detailed in its environments that really give off that tropical vibe, which I love. Definitely feels like a spring or summer game with the vibes that it gives off. I also want to praise the theater section, as always, for containing its funny skits and sketches that are fun to watch, and the coolest part is how this one is hidden behind a waterfall. Speaking of which, can we hear Luther slam into it one more time? That sound design is so satisfying. The final area is pretty great too, and is like the only time in the franchise's history other than the first screen of Freddy Fish 1 where you actually get to control Freddy by herself, which makes it extremely memorable. Plus, the underwater temple aesthetic is pretty unique. And then, of course, the game's ending sequence where it turns out that the person responsible for stealing the conch could actually be one of six different characters provides for great replayability because between the potential combinations of golden pipe locations and character endings, which are factored into a given playthrough separately from each other, means that there are technically 108 different combinations of pathways possible to experience in this game, which is the most possible combinations of any humongous game by almost double the runner-up. I know I praised Freddy Fish 2 for hosting 56, but after doing this math, I realized that Freddy Fish 3 has even more than that. Not that anyone needs to play the game 108 times for the full experience, you really only need 3 to do all the puzzles and 6 to see all the endings, but it signifies how each player's experience with the game likely differs from others. It's a solid game through and through, and former Humongous employees should definitely be proud of this one. Bebop Spidoo. <coughs> 
Number 3, and here we go. Spy Fox and Dry Cereal takes the number 3 spot as the first piece of the ultimate humongous entertainment game, Trifecta. These next three titles are, without question, the best projects Humongous Entertainment has ever made. Dry Serial, specifically, is an immersive, enthralling adventure game from beginning to end. The entire premise takes a popular trend at the time, that being the whole Got Milk campaign, and plays with it on so many different levels, especially with the villain William the Kid who's plotting to flood the planet with dairy milk and murder all the cows so everyone has to consume goat byproducts instead. You would think making a game based around a topical idea would make it age like, well, milk, but actually, I think it's aged flawlessly. It takes place on the island of Acidophilus, which has a lot of cool nooks and crannies to explore, with Spy Fox needing to rescue Mr. Utterly from Kid's warehouse down along the dock before really settling into the gameplay. It's a great introductory sequence, teaching the player about talk balloons and gadgets, which are staples of the Spy Fox inventory system, separate from all the others, and it really shows how the Spy Fox series takes on more of a focus on narrative compared to the other humongous IPs. The game has numerous combinations of pathways to take, with the two major ones being the car path and the boat path, as I call them. And anyone who's seen my Spy Fox retrospective will know the horrors I experienced playing against a certain Go Fish player on the latter route. After beating him though, the boat path is definitely the better of the two. It feels a lot longer and more interesting than the car, but the car isn't that bad either, just shorter. Then of course, there's also the item Fox needs to deactivate the Weapon of Destruction, which can be one of three different puzzles, as well as the obstacle blocking the way to Kid's main hub room at the end of the game that also has two different variations, providing for a total of 12 different potential combinations that could be experienced in this game. The writing is great, the characters you can encounter are great, the final chase sequence is incredible, especially when you figure out how to obtain the true secret ending for the first time, which blew my mind as a kid. And yeah, it's just a really memorable experience through and through. I could go on and on about this one, but then I'd probably end up spending another 30 minutes on this game just like I did in my retrospective, so I'll think I'll just leave it at that. If you want to hear more, like I said, feel free to check out my other video on the Spy Fox franchise as a whole. But in short, I love the way this one's story is told and the environment that Humongous created is one of the most memorable settings across all of their games. And the soundtrack, 10 out of 10, could not ask for better music. Definitely deserves the number three spot without question. Number two. And speaking about going on and on, Pajama Sam in No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside is taking the runner-up spot. Now, personally speaking, I enjoyed this game out of the entire company's legacy for a huge variety of reasons, but in all fairness, I will admit there is one game better than it at the end of the day. Still, the entire concept of Pajama Sam is brilliant. Take a childhood fear and personify it, make it a villain, then set the entire game inside the main character's own imagination with said fear at the end of it. The possibilities for that are limitless, and once you allow yourself to enter that realm of fantasy, creative freedom is at your fingertips, and I love the way Humongous really put this game together. The Land of Darkness is masterfully designed and laid out in such a way that it's just an amazing place to get lost in. Whether it's flowing down the deep blue river at night or exploring the underground caverns, or taking a warmer high-speed trip through the mines, or even roaming around the different rooms in Darkness' house. It is all bursting with personality and color, the puzzles are phenomenal, with each item having two different locations providing for a total possible eight combinations that a given playthrough could contain, and the characters that can be met along the way are the most memorable ones in the entire series. Otto, King, Carrot, Honestly, what can I even say that's negative about this? I guess some of the shots look a little rough around the edges in terms of the way they're drawn, but Humongous was still in its early stages of producing these games, so I can easily look past that. It's only the third major adventure title that was made using the computer scanning technique. I love the way the layout of the world provides for so many intersections, such as accessing the mines from the basement of Darkness's house, or getting him to the wishing well from underneath the caverns, and the fact that you can see King speed by every so often in certain rooms after you free him is just the coolest little detail. It really provides for a sense of immersion and depth to the land. There's a reason the Pajama Sam games are the most beloved titles out of Humongous's entire library, and while some might criticize me for putting the most popular choice at the top of the list, la di da, my response to that is simply, well, it's popular for a reason. I loved these games as a kid, far before I even knew how widespread Sam was compared to the rest of the properties, and I have no issue recognizing his games as the best. They just are. If I didn't put them at the top, I'd be lying to you. 
Whenever I go back to play through the humongous games, this will always be the biggest highlight for me, the most anticipated game. It is such a masterpiece when it comes to 90s computer software and is undoubtedly the one I will always praise the most. It is, dare I say, a near perfect game in my subjective eyes. It absolutely deserves to be in the highest tier of humongous games. Number 1 and by process of elimination, yes, this means that Pajama Sam 2, Thunder and Lightning Aren't So Frightening, takes the number one spot for all of the reasons that I just listed for the past several games. It is the definitive example of taking everything the first game did right and improving upon the rest, as little as there was, in every way possible. I will always prefer Pajama Sam 1, but I'd be lying if I said it was the better game. Pajama Sam 2 is equipped with not three, but four different weather machine parts to collect, each with a solid balance of difficulty when it comes to rescuing them from their various perils. Each character basically has what I'd call a short path and a long path. The short ones include things like rescuing Wingnut from this pipe or the Snowflake Inspector from the top of the warehouse, whereas the long versions of the same items would be rescuing Wingnut from the rain machine or locating the Inspector with Sid somewhere around the facility. The concept of the game is also brilliant, with Sam needing to help fix the weather factory by finding all the machine parts that he caused to go missing while learning about the weather along the way. And while it may or may not be the first instance of personifying the weather after a modern corporation complete with an office, warehouse, and factory, it's still stuck with me all these years. Now, instead of going into Sam's closet to visit a nighttime forest, you're climbing up through the attic to go up into the sky. It's such an ingenious way to present the game through Sam's own imagination again, and so many of the characters are just as iconic as the first title. Thunder and Lightning, of course, Carrot makes a return here too, and who could forget the extremely lovable Y-Pipe? The general layout design of the factory is pretty fun to explore, with it branching off into those three main locations that I mentioned just a second ago, and some of the machines are really imaginative and exciting. The rain machine has a fancy contraption to it, while the wind machine is this gigantic wind tunnel area, and the snow machine contains a conveyor belt with an inspection team and even a shrink ray. It's great fun through and through. It takes such well-known aspects of the weather and comes up with all sorts of creative ways to represent it. It's brilliant. Pajama Sam 2 is such a distinct sequel to the original title that it hardly feels like it's doing the same thing again outside of the typical adventure game structure, and yet it's just as amazing. It has a completely different take on the story, world, environment. Even just the fact that it takes place in broad daylight rather than at night creates an entirely different atmosphere. And again, while my personal preference leans me towards the first game, I do consider see that Pajama Sam 2 is the better one, and that is why I have given it the number one spot. And there you have it. This concludes my ranking of all 20 junior adventure games released by Humongous Entertainment from 1992 to 2003. I hope you guys enjoyed this final celebration of my retrospective series because, let me tell you, this series was not easy to make, easily the most challenging thing I've had to do yet. But I had a blast in doing so, and looking back at it now that it's finished, I can say that I'm pretty satisfied with the results. I set out to do this company justice by going as in-depth as possible and sharing my personal experience with their games growing up. And I'd say I've done a pretty good job of that, judging by the reception that these videos have all received. I honestly went into this expecting nobody to care and having this series fall on deaf ears because I didn't think that many people would even remember Humongous Entertainment anymore. Based on the responses I've gotten to these videos, however, well, suffice to say, that's clearly not the case, so I'm glad I could help contribute to keeping the memory alive. I had a blast making these videos, and I really hope that you continue to enjoy them for years to come. That said, thank you all for watching, and until next time, Shadow Streak signing off.